we know what excites us. We know what we love. We know what we're passionate about. <laughs> I'm Brian Pearson. I'm a musician, I'm a songwriter, I'm a writer. I produce and host a podcast called The Mystic Cave. I used to be for almost 40 years a minister, like a church minister, uh, specifically a priest with the Anglican Church of Canada. Retired from that a number of years ago and interestingly enough, I've never gone back so I think I've left the church. Instead, what I find is I'm thrilled every day to be exploring what I might call the spiritual terrain on the other side or on the far side of conventional religion. All the stuff I couldn't really explore while I was peddling one religion. Loved my work, loved the job, but more and more felt that the church could not, and maybe this is true of all religions, could not contain the kind of truth that it was, uh, it was conveying. So I'm in my retirement now and loving every minute of it because I keep going through whatever doors open and they keep opening. <laughs> When you're in the church, everyone calls what you do a vocation, and so, which means a calling. And so I would have considered my life's work to be my job, my career as a parish priest. And it certainly was engaging and involving at many levels, and, and as I've said, I, I loved it. But the older I got, the more I realized our jobs, however happy we may be in them, uh, are never our true vocation. That I think my real life's work really had to do with discovering who I was, um, who I was created to be. Discovering that and living it out. Whatever that meant in terms of other people's hopes and expectations uh, for me. Uh, certainly within the church there's lots of expectation of you be, you present as a certain kind of person. I'd like to think that had integrity. Uh, but we're more than our jobs. And when we retire from whatever our work has been, we can never retire from being who we are, finding out who we are, and living that out in the world. Of course, we all have challenges that life presents to us along the way. So um, I've had two broken marriages. Um, as a child moved, uh, across the country. Many times by the time I was 18, I'd lived in 11 different houses. So a lot of challenges um, life just presents to us. But I tend to think the real challenges are those inner challenges, the things that block us from becoming uh, who we are and who we're meant to be. So for me, one of the biggest challenges has been resolving the tension within me of what I call the lion and the lamb. I grew up in a nice suburban family where we were conflict averse. Um, I was the middle of three children. So that means I learned how to always be the mediator, the one making things right, the one who was pleasing the parents and other adults. Um, as, as, and that's the lamb. That's the one who just wanted to play it all gentle and not too ferocious. However, it would seem that part of who I am is also a lion. I've always known exactly what I want. And uh, because the lamb was so cultivated within my family, the challenge was, how do I own the lion? Because I got sneaky about it. I'd be uh, the good kid at home. And uh, then on the weekends, I'd go out and, and uh, be the wild child with all my friends so that the lion ended up ended up having to be snuck in. Um, this is problematic, uh, especially as we grow into ourselves. We don't want to be presenting one thing and uh, holding back another part, and especially within the church. Hard to be a lion uh, in the church, but sort of hilarious. So in the book of Isaiah, it's, uh, he talks about um, the days, the final days, when the lion and the lamb 
shall lay down together. They shall make peace with one another. And I think one of the main challenges for me was learning how to let the lion out. Because as long as he was locked away and kind of kept secret and hidden, it would come out sideways as sarcasm or nastiness, which then totally undermined everything else I wanted to do and to be. It wasn't until I sort of discovered the lion and said, there are times when the world needs you to fight for something. There's times you need to be ferocious. There's times you need to be scary. It's like finding the warrior within each of us. And when that happened, uh, I don't think I became the popular priest with my bishops after that. There was something coming out that was more threatening. And all of a sudden, I wasn't invited to sit on committees and, and be a part of the political structure, which at first was hurtful. And then I thought, are you kidding? This is like finding out who I really am. And I shouldn't be on those committees to begin with because there's something inside of me that wants to come out. So for me, the, one of the greatest challenges was uh, discovering who I was, accepting it, and celebrating it. It's so important that we discover, which we can only do over time, who we really are. Because when we're young, we have a lot of other people's expectations telling us who they want us to be. And we want to fulfill that. Some talk about the first half of life is all about uh, fulfilling other people's hopes and expectations for us. And we do that because we want to be able to have a life partner. We want to get a job. We want to have a nice home. All the things that we might want to do. But hidden within us, at the level of what I would call soul, is someone, the real us, who's trying to get out. And actually, if we do nothing at all, by midlife, the reason people have midlife crises is that when we reach midlife, that inner person is starting to get antsy and wants to come out and will start to break out and people will end marriages, they'll walk away from jobs and some, sometimes they'll get hooked in addictions, they'll do anything to sort of deal with this inner person who's trying to mess up their lives. Well, that inner person isn't trying to mess up our lives. That inner person is waiting to be born. And I, I think to, to listen to when we feel restless, when we feel that there is a hidden part of me that nobody knows, that's the invitation for us to live large, to say, okay, there's a part of me that none of you know because I don't know this person yet, and to begin to let them out. It's the most exciting thing about growing older. I was very fortunate along the way to have quite a lot of, of mentors. Um, most of them were father figure mentors, and they really began with my own dad. Um, and it wasn't, I can't even recall advice that these mentors would have given me. I think what they all have in common um, was each one in their own way believed in me. I think that's so important. Now, I can't speak for everyone, but I think for young men in particular, they need to have older men who have their back, who are in their corner with them saying, you can do this. So I'm so grateful for the mentors I've had who've had a trust in me, who believed in me, because that allowed me to believe in, in myself. So that was huge. Our souls already know who we are and who we're meant to be. And part of our, in the broad sense, part of our spiritual journey is to reconnect with our own souls, because our own souls will tell us. Let me tell you a story about that has to do with the music. So before I was ordained in the Anglican Church, I thought I was going to be a professional musician and songwriter. And I, I left school for a while, I made a demo tape, I took it around to all the record companies, I was doing all that. But I was also meeting a lot of very broken musicians who were playing the Holiday Inn circuit, doing covers of everyone else's songs but their own. Um, and I saw it was a hard, hard life. And it frightened me. So I went back to school, eventually finished school and became ordained. And I thought, well, my music can always be a hobby. It can always be in the background. But let me tell you, 20 years ago, so I was just turning 50, I went to see a concert, and some of you will know David Francie, um, a Canadian singer-songwriter who just him and a guitarist on stage. And it was a very intimate setting. He was telling his stories. He was playing his songs. And when he finished, everyone rose to give him a standing ovation because it was a magical evening. 
I had a lump in my throat and tears in my eyes. Now, I loved the music, and I thought, what is this? I think it was my soul reminding me, you love to do this yourself, and you gave it up, and it's time now for you to pick it up again. It didn't, that didn't come to me immediately. At first I felt ashamed and embarrassed that I had this emotional reaction. But I think those kind of reactions when they happen are also mentors for us. They're guiding us. They're inviting us to live a larger life. So after that, wouldn't you know, at the same time as soul was feeling that to me, I, uh, I met uh, the friend who has now become my guitar buddy, Mike and I, who play, we play together, we play gigs together, we record together. And I met him right around that time, such that it was soul not only speaking from the inside, but also speaking from the outside. So I think we need our mentors, the people in our lives who believe in us. We also need to listen to what's coming out from the inside, because our soul knows what we need. <laughs> I think um, there's a, life requires something of us to pay attention and that we often lived so distracted. There's so, and especially in the modern age, there's so much to distract us as if someone outside of ourselves can tell us who we are, what we need to do, what we need to be. Um, and that's not just social media. It's just constantly coming at us that there are others who would have some kind of design on who we should be. But I really think that paying attention has to be inward, not just, it has to be outward too. What does the world require of me? So what's my place in the world? That's a legitimate question. But I also think there's something that we need to pay attention to in ourselves that is wanting to express itself. We have to figure out how to do that. Like if somebody's in a and a pretty secure job, and they're raising a family, and they get an idea that I really always wanted to be an artist. That may be true. But you may also want to say, but I have some sacred commitments here that I have to honor, so I have to figure out how to start inviting the artist to come out without walking away from marriage, family, house, everything else, thinking that it has to be, I mean, that drama happens, and sometimes people need to do it. But I think paying attention is enough. If we pay attention to our souls, our souls will tell us what we need to, to do next, what's just our next step. And in my view, in my experience, life works like that. It only ever gives us the next step. And if we need to have a definition for faith, it doesn't even have to be connected with religious belief. Faith is our willingness just to take that next step that our soul invites us to. And this connects, in my mind, with, with a word that sort of sums it up, which is curiosity. What are you curious about? Because that comes from somewhere. If I'm curious about something, I'll take a step in its direction. When I was feeling again the, the old, all the old feelings around music and how much I wanted to do music, I didn't know, what to, I didn't know how to get started. I took the next step, which is I began playing music with my friend Mike. That was, that's all I needed to do. Doors continued to open one at a time. So I think there's something about just paying attention. What are you curious about? And what's presenting itself to you next? And that's the only next, that's the only step you need is the next one. One of the things that gets us, uh, that stands in our way from becoming who we are would be the things that we get addicted to. During my ministry in the church, I heard literally hundreds of what gets known in the 12-step program as fifth steps. The fifth step of the 12 steps is a brutal inventory, moral inventory of your own life, where you look back at your resentments for how people have hurt you, for your harms you've done to others, for your sex conduct, your fears. It's all those things that um, have waylaid us. And there's a reason for them. I mean, having heard, as I say, hundreds of these things, so often somebody started using or drinking or whatever their addiction was 
to cover for a hurt uh, in some way that life hurt them, um, and sometimes to help them become the person that they w wanted to be. So addictions, at the first, they seem to hold out or any kind of substances or whatever we turn to, hold out a promise that, oh, I can heal myself, I can become who I am, but we know what happens in addictions is they take over our lives. And if they take over our lives, we're not living the life we're called to live. The reason I heard all those step fives, and the reason I kept hearing them, and I felt it was so important, was when somebody's able to name their truth, to name what has hurt them, and the ways they've hurt other people, and to come clean, it's like a start over for them. It's like I can go back to when I was 12 years old and picked up the first drink. I can go back and revisit all the hurts that were inside of me then and begin to, to name them and to address my own healing. And when that happens, I don't need the addictions because I'm back on track with kind of figuring out who I am. So addictions are a powerful distraction from becoming who we really are. I'll be 70 this uh, summer, and now as an older gent, uh, my, my body parts may be failing me. Every, every time I turn around, something hurts. So there's a part of me that feels, damn, like, uh, you know, I've tried to stay in pretty good shape and my body's betraying me. In spite of that, this is, without qualification, the best time of my life. I just find the doors opening for me being who I am and expressing that in the world, uh, following my curiosity to the next door, uh, trying that. Oh, that doesn't work out. Let's try something else. So it's funny. I think people often look at those of us who are aging and uh, they see that, yeah, uh, He's carrying his body more carefully, like obviously, you know, he's been in pain or he has health problems of one kind or another. That's what people see. They may see our mental deterioration as our memories no longer serve us well. All of that may be true, but it's the best time in our lives to finally, unapologetically be who we were made to be. And in that way, finally make our contribution to the world. Something else about uh, getting older is um, an opportunity to face our fears. And a lifetime gives us lots of things to fear and, tell, uh, and to tell us we can't do things. Well, yeah, there are certain things we can't do anymore. But also it's an opportunity to face each one of those fears and say, wait a minute, why are you a fear? I can solve this. I, I, um, last fall I went on an ambitious program uh, that took place camping in the fields and forests of Kentucky. I had all these fears, all these reasons I shouldn't do that. I'm getting too old, my back's going to go out on me, and I'm going to be obviously not fit enough to be able to do this camping thing with, I imagined, a bunch of young, buff adults uh, who would be with me. I had all these reasons why not to do it, and I decided I want to do this. So I addressed each fear one at a time until by the time I got in my car to drive down to that program, I was fearless, literally. I had a marvelous time. The program was everything I'd hoped it would be. And if I'd listened to any one of those fears, any one of those voices, um, I wouldn't have gone. I wouldn't have signed up. So I think it's a stage in life when we get to this point where we don't have to be held captive by our fears. And in fact, you face any of them down, most of them shrivel away. I think there is a hidden truth already resident within each of us. We already know the truth. Uh, what happens very often in the religious world is somebody is trying to tell you the truth as if they possess it and you don't. But I think that we already have enough truth resident within us that if somebody else is trying to tell us their truth, we don't have to accept it. We can go inward and go, does that feel right? Does that feel true to me? Because we already know. And one of the things that we already know that we don't often count as wisdom is we know what excites us. We know what we love. We know what we're passionate about. Often those are the things that we push to the side and think, well, yeah, but life requires me to be responsible and, and that's just play. Well, Joseph Campbell, who had studied all the world's myths and was asked, 
In the end, what are they all about? What's the wisdom we can take away from this? He said, follow your bliss. Follow what you love. I just, I think it's a brilliant way of stating what now becomes the obvious. You know what you're called to do in your life. So it has to do with more than, more with who you are than what you do. But we know already in our hearts what we're called to do. Follow our bliss just means do it. When you do what you love to do, you're happier, you're a better person, and the world is a better place. So I find, for me, that's the wisdom that, that I now hold before myself, thinking, looking back over my life, thinking, every time I have followed my bliss, it sometimes led me to challenges and difficulties and made tensions appear in my life where tensions didn't belong before. But actually, every time I obeyed and followed my bliss, it led me deeper and deeper who, into who I think I am called to be. And I think the world has been made a better place with each one of those steps.